Question orale, oral questions, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to China, this government is out of step with our allies. Last week, the U.S. Treasury Department imposed sanctions on four more officials involved in the draconian security laws in Hong Kong. That makes 15 in total. The number of officials sanctioned by the Canadian government? Zero, Mr. Speaker. Why is this government always hanging back when it comes to getting serious with China? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, Canada has a complex, multi-dimensional relationship with China that uh, looks at challenges and engage with China with eyes wide open. Many international partners are also facing similar challenges and are actively engaging with them in order to evaluate best approaches together. We have been clear about the principles and commitment to the rule of law, our deep concern for our citizens who have been detained, and our farmers and producers. We remain firm in defending the, our principles and interests, and always will. The Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to threats against Canadian citizens, our eyes have been wide open for years. Chinese Canadians have been subjected to intimidation, not just in Hong Kong, but here in Canada as well. At committee, immigration officials admitted they do not track nor do they try to stop Chinese agents posing as students, as tourists or workers. Why is the Prime Minister failing to protect Canadians that speak out against the Chinese Communist regime? Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, Canada has among the best security agencies in the world, and the folks who work for our security agencies work every single day to keep Canadians safe. Not all of it appears in the newspapers. On the contrary, a lot of the work that is, is done uh, in important situations uh, is never heard of at all. But we will continue to ensure we're supporting our security agencies, uh, supporting uh, Canadians who speak up, and protecting all Canadians from foreign interference or influence, uh, because we know that to be free in Canada is the best thing in the world. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, our security agencies know that Huawei cannot be in our 5G network, so I hope the Prime Minister votes with us on our motion. Yeah, yeah. When, Aust when Australia realized they had a problem with infiltration by Chinese agents, they did something about it. They stopped infiltration on campuses, in business, in academia. This Prime Minister weighs his fig finger and says interference is inappropriate. Chinese agents threatening Canadians on our soil, and all this Prime Minister has to say is it's inappropriate. Will the Prime Minister show Canadians that he has a plan to keep them safe from Chinese operations in Canada? The right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, our security agencies have worked with a range of Canadian uh, institutions and universities uh, uh, to make sure that they are safe. Uh, Canadian universities, of course, work with a range of industry partners on research projects. So we created a working group with universities and those national security agencies to help Canadians safeguard their work and identify potential risks. We will always protect data and intellectual property, advance science, and ensure that international research partnerships are always beneficial official to Canadians. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Les Etats-Unis. The United States, the UK, Australia and New Zealand have all said no to Huawei as part of their 5G. They put the interests of their fellow citizens ahead of the Chinese state. But the Liberal government continues to admire China and is ignoring the safety and security of Canadians. When will the Prime Minister say no to Huawei in our 5G network? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. 5G technology can respond to an increase in use, users and provide uh, higher capacity and faster service. We will ensure that Canadians benefit from the best 5G technology and will always be there to protect the security and interests of Canadians. That's why we're working with our security agencies that will make recommendations on the best way to ensure competitiveness and protection for Canadians and our companies. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the Liberal member for saint laurent talks about uh, the decline of French in Montreal as a myth. But the real myth, uh, Mr. Speaker, is that the Liberal government claims to protect French in Quebec. Since 2015, we've been waiting for a modernization of the Official Languages Act. No action and lots of delays. 
Does the Prime Minister agree with his Member of Parliament? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. The Member for Saint Laurent apologized for her insensitive remarks, and as a Montrealer, I am concerned about the decline we are seeing in French. The government will always be there to protect French across the country, be it in official language minority communities or in Quebec. We acknowledged in the throne speech that French has a specific status in North America, and we are going to work in Quebec and across the country to protect French. We are here to protect francophones across the country. The Honourable Member for Belle Chambly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Prime Minister. Our rights stop where injury to others occur. Those are the words of the Minister of Canadian Heritage. Now, based on what the Minister of Canadian Heritage said, he's responsible for the CRTC, Radio Canada, and Culture, that I would lose my right, that anyone would lose their rights, that we all lose our freedom of expression as soon as someone decides to d state that they are injured or offended by what is being said. Can the Prime Minister confirm that? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. No, Mr. Speaker, we will always defend the freedom of expression and our creators and artists, their right to, to challenge our authorities, to ch challenge each other. We need our creators to make us laugh, to make us think about a better world, a different world. Our creators are the essence of our identity. We will always support them and defend their freedom of expression. The Honourable Member for Belle Chambly. Look, talking about creators, who's in charge of censorship at Radio Canada? Because of a comment, not a complaint, not a letter to the Ombudsman, a simple comment, an episode of La Petite Vie was censored by Radio Canada, and it was replaced by a warning in the event that someone would have, uh, might have uh, con confused La Petite Vie with a BBC documentary. Can, an, can the Prime Minister tell us if Guylaine Tremblay, Marc Labrèche, or Claude Meunier uh, criticizing a black, playing a black, is, needs to be censored at Radio Canada? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. We, Mr. Speaker, we will always defend the right and freedom of expression, the ability to fully express oneself in this country. Decisions made by Radio Canada are independent of uh, what uh, uh, of the government. We expect everyone to uh, defend uh, fundamental rights. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Thank you, Mr. President. Oh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, the Liberals, the Conservatives, and the Bloc voted against our motion to tax the ultra-rich and excessive profits being made by large corporations. Families are having trouble making ends meet, and the ultra-rich people have recorded record profits. Why does the Prime Minister always defend the ultra-rich? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. On the contrary, Mr. Speaker. When we were elected in 2015, the first thing we did was to increase taxes on uh, uh, the rich and reduce them for the middle class. Unfortunately, the NDP voted against that initiative. Each step along the way, we were there to help the middle class, to help lift Canadians out of poverty. And during the pandemic, we are here to help Canadians, workers and small business. We are going to ensure that we are always there to help Canadians to make it through this crisis, to create a better world, because they are prosperous. We will be there for Canadians each step along the way. Well, let's talk about what happened yesterday. Yesterday, the Liberals, the Conservatives and the Bloc voted against our motion to tax the ultra-wealthy and to tax the excess profits of large corporations. Let's talk about what excess profits look like. Westons, who own large grocery stores across Canada, have received massive profits during this pandemic, and what they're doing is increasing dividend payouts to their shareholders while they are cutting the pay of frontline workers. So why does this Prime Minister stand with the Westons instead of frontline workers? The Honourable Prime Minister. On the contrary, Mr. Speaker, the very 
first thing this government did in 2015 when we got elected was we raised taxes on the wealthiest 1% so we could lower them for the middle class. And what did the NDP do, Mr. Speaker? They voted against it. Every step of the way, we have been there to support the middle class, to support people working hard to join it, and to make sure Canadians got ahead. Whether it was a million jobs created uh, over the past five years, whether it was a million people lifted out of poverty, Mr. Speaker, at the same time, we will continue to fight for Canadians and for their success. The Honourable Member for Wellington, Halton Hills. Monsieur le Président, le gouvernement... Mr. Speaker, the government has finally acknowledged that its policy isn't working, and that's why it's going to be introducing a new uh, policy framework for China. China has put in place subversive operations here in Canada. It's targeting Canadians and jeopardizing the rights and freedoms of Canadians. When will the government put forth a real plan to stop China's operations here in Canada. The Honourable Minister of Foreign Affairs, I thank my honourable colleague for his question. Mr. Speaker, on the motion put forth by the Conservative Party today, we were pre prepared to move amendments, constructive amendments, to advance the situation. In terms of foreign policy and national security, what we want is to work with opposition members with respect to the new framework we're putting forth, it, this is a normal development since 2020. China of 2020 is not the, the same as it was many years ago. We are developing plans to respond to, to this new reality. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Deputy de Wellington. The Honourable Member for Wellington, Halton Hills. Le Président, que le... Mr. Speaker, I hope that the government will be voting in favour of our motion tomorrow. The government said it would make a decision on Huawei before the election. Then in July it said it would make a decision on Huawei after the election. It's now been more than a year since the election and still no decision. The government also says that it believes in multilateralism, but four of the five eyes have already made a decision to restrict Huawei from their networks. Canada is unilaterally alone in not making a decision. When will the government join with their allies and make a decision on Huawei's participation in Canada's 5G network? Join with us. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, our government is going to continue to ensure that Canadian networks are kept safe and secure, and we've been consistent on this point for many months now. While we won't comment on any specific companies, an examination of 5G technologies and a review of security and economic considerations is ongoing. We're going to weigh these matters with allies and partners, with our security experts, and we're going to make the best decision for Canadians, not on the basis of politics. Yeah. Member for Lakeland. Mr. Speaker, the public safety minister says he doesn't, quote, tolerate hostile foreign actors threatening Canadians, but China's operation Fox Hunt continues without real action to charge and arrest state-sponsored bullies terrorizing Canadians. This morning, the foreign minister said the public safety minister will bring forward measures to protect the safety and security of Canadians. So to the minister, and for all those being harassed and bullied by China's communist regime, what exactly are those actions, and when will they be implemented? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And, and let me also be very clear that we know that the activities of hostile state actors um, are, are prevalent in this country. They use their intelligence and security services to threaten and intimidate individuals outside their country, and when individuals in Canada are subjected to harassment, manipulation, or intimidation by foreign states. These, in, these activities constitute a threat to Canada's sovereignty and to the safety of all Canadians. And that's why, Mr. Speaker, I want to assure them that our security agencies and law enforcement agencies are actively taking steps to protect them, their personal information, and their interests, both domestic and foreign, from the threat of foreign interference and espionage. The Honourable Member for Lakeland. Well, he recognizes this reality, but on China, these Liberals are clearly falling behind our allies, and they are failing to protect the safety and security of Canadians. In one year, Operation Fox Hunt coerced 680 people around the world with stark options, return to China or commit suicide, and families in China are threatened or arrested to force compliance. Canada's National Security Committee report said that part of this operation is even carried out here at home in RCMP offices. The U.S. has already made arrests. So how far does this go? How many Canadians will be harmed before this government, this minister, actually does something? Honourable Minister. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And, and, and again, I would, I would reiterate that we are taking a whole of government approach, protecting the, the interests of Canadians and security of Canadians. Our security and intelligence community, including CSIS and the RCMP, are actively investigating threats of foreign interference and espionage, and where the evidence exists, We'll take action, but I, in addition to that, Mr. Speaker, we've undertaken a significant outreach campaign to sensitize Canadians, Canadian companies, and other stakeholders involved, involved in this activity or subject to, to this activity. Mr. Speaker, we will take the steps necessary to keep Canadian interests safe. The Honourable Member for Shakutimi Lafior. Mr. Speaker, the Communist Party of China is working tirelessly to expand its sphere of influence economically, militarily, and diplomatically. The extent of its sphere of influence has never been clearer than recently as we face a global pandemic originating in China. The World Health Organization is under Chinese influence. Designated scientists are struggling to investigate the origins of the virus in China. Why does the government have blind faith in a compromised organization? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, it's uh, concerning to hear the member opposite talk about the World Health Organization under the influence of, uh, of China. Listen, we know that the World Health Organization, like every organization, will have to conduct a review about how they've managed the global pandemic. But we also know that the institution plays a critical role in beating back not just COVID-19, Mr. Speaker, but diseases like Ebola, diseases like HIV AIDS, diseases like the measles. Mr. Speaker, we need global action on disease. It's what protects us. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Chicoutimi Le Fior. Chinese forces are at work in Canada and they're threatening Canadian interests. By blindly relying on a compromised organization, the government has put the lives of Canadians at risk. It hasn't listened to Canadian experts. It cut funding to the Global Public Health Intelligence Network. It's questioned the asymptomatic transmission of COVID-19. Who is the government accountable to? Canadians or to the Chinese regime? The Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, every step of the way, we've relied on public health experts and officials, uh, people that have uh, de epidemiological advice and, and virologists to guide our response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Mr. Speaker, we've worked with international partners. We've done the work that is needed to protect Canadians, and we're going to continue that work, Mr. Speaker. This is a global incident of public health crisis, and we have to rely on science as the way out. Mr. Speaker, it is concerning to hear the member opposite not understand that science is the way out of this crisis, and in fact, we will work strongly with all... Mr. Speaker, we'll work strongly with all partners to ensure that we support provinces and territories and Canadians. The Honourable Member for Belle et Chambly. Another title for the Prime Minister. Canada is investing more than $100 billion in a policy for naval construction. Two-thirds are going to Irving in Halifax and one-third to C-SPAN in B.C. Less than $3 billion, less than 3% to Davie in Quebec City, which is the, one of the largest and most reliable shipyards in the country, with 50% of the naval capacity in this country. Today, we've learned that by buying to the... Uh, the Obelix and the Asterix from Davy, Canada would have saved between two and three billion dollars for the resupply ships. Mr. Speaker, what's the Liberals' problem with Davy and to the Quebec City region? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. There are no problems, Mr. Speaker, with between the government and to Davy. We initiated negotiations to include the Davy shipyard as an authorized uh, shipyard under the National uh, Shipyard Construction Strategy. $2.1 billion has gone uh, to Davy so far. Other contracts are under negotiation. And Davy is a very important uh, partner for the Government of Canada, Mr. Speaker. We are proud to work with the Davy Shipyard and with the workers of the Davy Shipyard. The Honourable Member for Beauport-Limolou, Mr. Speaker, the government had the choice award Davy, 1.4 billion in contracts, or award over 4 billion under the shipbuilding strategy. The difference is 2.6 billion dollars. That's how much the government is willing to spend to avoid giving Davy a contract. The price of not doing business in Quebec. That's 150 dollars that each Quebec taxpayer throws out the window to keep the best shipyard in North America idle. 
Those are Quebec taxpayer dollars. When will the government finally give Davy its fair share of contracts? 20 percent, not less than 3 percent. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, once again, I would point out that we are very happy to work with Davy and very happy with the asterisk and, and with the work it's doing. And the Parliamentary Budget Officer has stated we're comparing apples to oranges between the asterisk and the resupply ship. The resupply ships are uh, underway in Vancouver, and there are other promising contracts uh, available for Hadevi. Edmonton Centre. Mr. Speaker, days after Meng Wanzhou, executive of the Chinese giant Huawei, was arrested in 2018, two Canadians were arrested by the Chinese government in an act of retaliation. Yet this government is still toying with the idea to allow China to plant the seeds of digital control in our country and freely collect Can Canadians' data and personal information. Will the government commit today to ban 5G Huawei? The Honourable uh, Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And we're well aware that emerging fifth generation technologies are a global phenomenon, and we're going to ensure that Canadians benefit from the latest and most beneficial 5G innovations. But we're going to do this in a way that accounts for all security, economic, and scientific considerations. We're going to listen to our experts, and we'll make a decision in due course. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Centre. Mr. Speaker, this government has underestimated the scale and ambition of China and its Trojan horse opportunism for too long. China's counter-espionage law says that, in any case, the CCP deems relevant organization and individuals must provide espionage evidence truthfully and may not refuse. Even if Huawei says it won't hand data to the Chinese government, it wouldn't have a choice. Does the minister recognize the security risk in allowing Huawei to operate 5G in Canada? Public safety. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'm sure the member opposite understands that, that I am not going to discuss ongoing security or criminal investigative activities uh, undertaken by our, our very able security and law enforcement agencies. However, um, I want to assure him, um, and I would point to, to him, for example, to the work of the NCI COP uh, committee that released a report earlier this year making it very clear that China is, is a key and growing risk in this regard, and, and as has already been stated. The government is eyes wide open. We work very closely with all of our 5i partners. We are well aware of all of the risks inherent to, to, to this, and we are prepared to take the action necessary at the appropriate time. De the Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Old Saint Charles. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, recently uh, the uh, Canadian International Trade Tribunal was considering a contract between the government and NewTek uh, for X ray scan scanners in Canadian embassies around the world. Last night at committee, we learned that the contract had been cancelled with this company, which is owned by the Chinese government. I find it unfortunate that the contract was cancelled only after Canadians uh, brought pressure to bear uh, that would have uh, represented threats uh, to the security of Canadians. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for this opportunity to clarify the situation. The contract was not approved, and we stated very clearly there was a tender call, and at that point, to Mr. Speaker, we said that national security took precedence, and none of those products were purchased. And once we became aware of the situation, we redid the tender call. National security is always a criteria especially when it comes to security equipment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Old Saint-Charles. Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to see that the government is starting to understand that we can't have uh, confidence in the Chinese regime. We saw another contract with CanSino for vaccinations. Now, with Mastec, the government has understood that we can't have confidence in them. So my question is simple. Can the Minister of Public uh, of your current Canada will uh, ensure that, that no further contracts are signed with the Chinese regime. The Honourable Minister, I'd like to thank the member for his question. I think that I was clear 
And I think that parliamentarians in this House understand that national security takes precedence in contracts. We have stated that repeatedly today, national security is always a first criteria. That's the government's responsibility to keep Canadians safe. Enter. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In Manitoba, the provincial and federal government have had eight months to fix health and safety issues occurring in federally owned long-term care homes. They failed. We now have outbreaks of COVID-19 at Maples and Parkview Place long-term care homes. Workers and residents are getting sick and losing their lives. The federal government owns Rivera facilities, and it's time they stop playing jurisdictional games and honour their responsibility to keep residents and workers safe and alive. Live. When will the Liberals own their part of the crisis and make sure workers and loved ones can survive the pandemic? The Honourable Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, I think every member in this House is concerned with the growth of cases and indeed the tragic deaths that are occurring across the country as a result of COVID-19. And our hearts are with all of the families that have lost a loved one. And in, in, in this difficult time, we all have to continue to pull together. We need a Team Canada approach, Mr. Speaker, and that's exactly what we've been providing. Whether it's $19 billion to provinces and territories, whether it's millions of rapid tests to provinces and territories, whether it's additional supports as in over 250 Canadian Red Cross people deployed into long-term care homes, Mr. Speaker, including in Manitoba, will continue to be there, Mr. Speaker, for all Canadians, no matter which province they're in. The Honourable Member for Courtney Alberni. Mr. Speaker, the government promised supports to small businesses, and this House passed legislation on November 6th. But businesses are still waiting, and they're incurring massive debt while they wait. Ultimately, the Liberals shouldn't have delayed. This should have been passed in the summer, but they prorogued Parliament, even though everyone knew a second wave was coming. Time is running out for so many small businesses that are closed again to protect public health. This government needs to move quickly. Why are the Liberals not asking the Senate to convene and pass these supports. Where is the sense of urgency to save Canadian small businesses? Honourable Minister for Small Businesses. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Member for that important question. That urgency is what we have been dealing with right from day one. Making sure that we have supports to help them pay for staff, to pay for fixed costs, and to get that liquidity support in the small business loans. We have taken this with absolute urgency from day one. We will continue to do that every single day so we can bridge them beyond this crisis. And I want to thank small businesses for all the work that they're doing for our country. Thank you. Good the Honourable Member for Davenport. Mr. Speaker, the opioid crisis continues to be one of the most serious public health crises in Canada's history. Tragically, the impact of COVID-19 is only worsening this crisis, and many communities like my riding of Davenport are feeling the effects. Canadians can't wait. Leadership on this issue will save hundreds of lives. Can the Minister of Health share some of the work the federal government is doing to address the devastating impacts of the opioid crisis? Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for her passionate advocacy for people who use substances. Every person who uses the substances has a, deserves the right to treatment, deserves the right to compassionate care. And as we co fight COVID-19, we can't forget about the epidemic of opiate overdose uh, that is happening here in our country. And that's why we announced nearly 9.5 million for four safer supply projects in Ontario, including two in Toronto, Mr. Speaker. That is a way to ensure that people have access to safer substances, less toxic drugs. In fact, we'll continue to tackle this epidemic by expanding access to a safe supply of prescription opioids, committing over $700 million, Mr. Speaker, towards effective treatment and fighting stigma that prevents people from reaching The Honourable Member for Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. Mr. Speaker, the Foreign Affairs Minister has repeatedly said that he is disturbed by the treatment of Uyghurs, but his feelings haven't led to any action. In fact, the government remains complicit in the abuse of Uyghurs by failing to put in place safeguards to address the sourcing of products made by Uyghur slave labour and by funding the Belt and Road Initiative through the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. So when will the government use Magnitsky sanctions to hold perpetrators accountable, protect the integrity of our supply chains, and withdraw Canadian taxpayers' dollars from the AIIB? The Honourable Minister of Foreign Affairs. 
Mr. Speaker, uh, the honourable member is correct. We are gravely concerned on this side of the House, and I think all parliamentarians, when it comes to the plight of the Uyghur, Mr. Speaker, I raised this issue both publicly and privately with the Chinese authority. We welcome the work of the committee. And more than that, Mr. Speaker, I did speak to the UN High Representative for Human Rights to look with her what the international community can do in terms of actions to assess the situation and report back to the international community. Mr. Speaker, we're going to work with the international community to hold China to account to its international obligations. The Honourable Member for Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. Mr. Speaker, he didn't need to wait for feedback from the UN. Canadian parliamentarians have been suggesting real action that this minister could be taking for a very long time. Now, last year, Conservatives asked the government about CPP investments in Chinese military-affiliated tech companies playing a significant role in the surveillance and mass detention of Uyghurs. All we heard back at the time was that they were looking out for the interests of Canadian pensioners. Has the government done anything to prevent CPP funds from enabling grievous human rights abuses? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I, I'm really surprised to hear the member speak when he said that we should not work with the UN when it comes to investigating a serious situation. Mr. Speaker, I'm surprised. What we said, Mr. Speaker, is that we have taken action. The member for whom I have the utmost respect always says take action. Mr. Speaker, we took action. We're talking to, you, to the United Nations High Representative for Human Rights talking to her to say what is the international community is going to do and lending Canada support. I think Canadians who are watching, Mr. Speaker, expect Canada to work with the international community to hold China to account in terms of its international obligations. Honourable Member for Calgary knows Hill. Mr. Speaker, we're 10 months into the COVID crisis and news of potential vaccines are starting to surface. But for months, immunologists, pharmacists and public health officials have been asking the federal government to table a transparent plan on where Canada is on the list to receive a vaccine, how the vaccine will be delivered to Canadians and who will get it first. On what date will the Prime Minister make public this plan or does he even have one? Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as scientists have been working around the world on their important work to uncover effective vaccines for COVID-19, we've been working to make sure that Canadians will have access and be able to get vaccinated when the time comes. That's why we've secured a range of vaccines, Mr. Speaker, and hundreds of millions of doses for Canadians so that Canadians are safe and well served when they arrive. A few vaccine candidates have published some promising results and seem to be moving quickly. This is the light at the end of the tunnel. I know that we need to continue to work closely together uh, to get through the next several months, but we will continue to work with all of our partners to ensure that Canadians have access to vaccines when they arrive. Honourable Member for Calgary Nose Hill. So, Mr. Speaker, for those watching, that's word salad for we don't have a plan and we don't have details. And today we learned that the military might actually have to be deployed regarding the vaccine. But we still don't have details on who's going to get it in what order, how it's going to be distributed, and how some of the logistic details might be addressed. The health minister didn't deliver rapid tests in a way that could have stopped the second wave. Is her incompetence or the prime minister's the reason why, 10 months into COVID, we don't have any details on vaccine? distribution. The Honourable Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And this is a whole of government approach. In fact, it's a Team Canada approach. We'll be working closely with provinces, territories, indeed local public health as we need to. This is a, an endeavour that will require all hands on deck. And Mr. Speaker, I'm so thrilled with the work of people like the Vaccine Task Force, hardworking volunteer Canadians who have been helping the government of Canada to procure the most effective vaccines. In fact, we can see that that is resulting in ensuring that Canadians have access to promising vaccines, to the number of doses that we'll need. We'll continue that hard work, Mr. Speaker, and I know that Canadians are, are looking forward to the light at the end of the tunnel. The Honourable Member for La Pointe de Lille. Mr. Speaker, for a long time now, the Bloc Québécois has been decrying the anglicization of Quebec, supported by the federal government through its promotion of services in English. Today, 200 people reported businesses in Montreal where they couldn't get served in French. The minister confirmed to me yesterday, not just once but twice, that she acknowledged French was in decline and that she was going to do something about it. Can she announce any concrete step, anything she will do to address the immediate concerns of Quebecers? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Obviously, we have to be there to protect Francophones 
language rights, be it in Quebec or elsewhere in Canada. The government has acknowledged that more needs to be done to protect the French language. We know it's a minority language across Canada and even in the world. I'm happy to work with my colleague when we announce an important reform to the Official Languages Act to recognize the situation and that the federal government can set an example and can do more to protect access to the French language. The Honourable Member for La Pointe de Lille. Mr. Speaker, it's not hard to get. There's one official language in Quebec, French. One language under threat in Quebec, French. And one language Ottawa supports in Quebec, English. In its throne speech, the government undertook to protect and promote French in Canada, but the Official Languages Act is really all about encouraging institutional bilingualism and service in English. That's why the Feds have butchered Bill 101 since 1977. When is this government going to stop undermining French in Quebec? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I strongly disagree with my colleague because the fact is we are supporting francophones in Quebec and the government of Quebec. There are French, French services and immigration under the bilateral agreement around immigration. We're also there to support artists and cultural artists uh, in supporting Radio-Canada and other institutions. We are also there to support culture and the French fact through telefilm and all kinds of cultural institutions. So we are an ally to francophones. The Honourable Member for Richmond, Arthabasca. Mr. Speaker, last week, the member for Saint Laurent said she needed proof that French was declining in Quebec and Canada. In my opinion, she must not be reading any studies or listening to any news to make that kind of claim. I don't think she goes uh, to very many parts of Montreal. She's way out of touch. But not a single Liberal member, and particularly none from Quebec, stood up to condemn her disrespectful remarks, disrespectful of all francophones in Quebec and outside Quebec. Does the Prime Minister or the Minister of Official Languages have the courage to stand up and condemn those remarks? The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I'd invite my colleague to deal with his own members. Both official languages sh should be strenuously defended in Canada. And I'd like to see them stand up and do more to defend both official languages, because it's fundamental. French needs to be present in Quebec and outside Quebec. The Honourable Member for Richmond, Arthabasca. Mr. Speaker, these are the facts. They've been in power for five years. Text messages from COVID Alert app in English only, a billion-dollar contract for We Charity, a unilingual English organization, conference calls in English only, labeling authorized in English only, and a refusal to respond clearly to Quebec on the enforcement of Bill 101 in federally regulated workplaces. And they have n no business lecturing us. It's time they tabled legislation to modernize official languages as called for by all the organizations. That's all we're waiting for. The Honourable Minister. You know, the Liberal government has no lessons to take from the Conservatives. The fact is, just look at the damage they did. There were massive cuts to all services in French. And the stakeholders, francophones, uh, particularly outside Quebec, were calling, were crying famine after 10 years of the Harper government. So we've turned things around. We've supported the French language. We've also provided support for CBC and Radio Canada because there were cutbacks to that strong institution as well. And we've restored the Court Challenges program. The Honourable Member for Richmond, Arthabasca. Mr. Speaker, the minister is just talking, but there's no action. 
The consultations have been done. The reports have been tabled. The Senate and the Commissioner of Official Languages have made their recommendations. And the government of Quebec is waiting. The Liberals have been in power for five years, and there's less than four weeks left before the holidays. If the Prime Minister and his mission, Minister of Official Languages are anything more than all talk, no action, what are they waiting for? Why haven't they tabled legislation here in the House? They should table that legislation now. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Clearly, my colleague needs his memory jogged. We appointed bilingual judges to the Supreme Court. We did it, but Harper refused. We have recognized those who have vested rights. We are there to protect language rights through the Court Challenges Program. Those are all clear and concrete steps that we had to take because of the failure of the Conservative government to protect official languages. We are there beside Francophone and other language minorities, and uh, we will also overhaul the legislation. The Honourable Member for Humber River, Black Creek. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the gun violence in our big cities is getting out of control. Last weekend, in my riding of Humber River, Black Creek, an innocent 12-year-old boy named Dante was killed as he was shopping with his mother. As we mourn the loss and honour the memory of this brave young life, we must resolve to end gun violence once and for all. Could the Minister of Public Safety please report to this House what this government has done, what the government is committed to do to keep guns off our street and end the gun violence in Canada? Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member from, for Humber River, Black Creek, and, and share in her condolences to the family and friends of Dante uh, Andreata uh, for this tra tragic and senseless crime. Mr. Speaker, we have taken very significant steps. We've invested nearly $327 million to assist law enforcement right across this country, but uh, to the tune of $65 million in Ontario to, to deal with gun violence and the activities of gangs. But we know, Mr. Speaker, that there is so much more that we must do, and the tragic death of Dante Andriotti must deepen the resolve of every member of this House to reduce gun violence. And that's why, Mr. Speaker, we'll strengthen gun control and we'll make investments of $250 million, as promised, to build up resilience in communities and invest in our The Honourable Member for Yorkton Melville. Speaker, the backlog of 50,000 veterans' applications is impacting our veterans' mental health. Sanctuary trauma is deeply rooted in a veteran's sense of this government's lack of sacred obligation. December 2018, Shane Jones wrote to the Prime Minister himself documenting ways that he was being treated unfairly by VAC since being medically released in 2008. Yes, his concerns are with current and past governments. The Minister of Veterans Affairs replied personally in June of 2020 to Shane and ordered a departmental review of his file four and a half months ago. When will his review be complete? The Honourable Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And of course, the backlog is totally unacceptable to this government. And that's why, in fact, we invested just under $200 million to make sure we we're able to hire 350 new employees uh, to train them to deal with the backlog. Along with that, Mr. Speaker, we have uh, over 160 uh, other employees who are in training to make sure they deal with the backlog. Along with that, we're uh, digitizing the files and making sure that uh, the people who approve the files are coordinated in appropriate fashion. We have and will address the backlog, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cypress Hills Grasslands. Mr. Speaker, Roger Foley was born with a severe neurodegenerative disease. He gave moving testimony last week on Bill C-7 at committee. Roger helped take care of his father who was suffering with cancer until his own disabilities got worse. Now the health care system has failed him. They denied him the supports that provide him the dignity of living at home. Roger would like to know, does the Liberal government think it should be easier for him to end his life than access the supports to affirm and enhance his life? Full Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, we know that people with disabilities deserve all of the supports to live their full, uh, their full potential with the full dignity, um, no matter where they live in this country. And that's why we've worked so closely with the disability community and with our stakeholders at the provincial and territorial levels to make sure that they have the capacity to provide that support. Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue that hard work. Uh, everyone, including people like Roger, have the right to live with full dignity in the choice, uh, the, in the manner that they choose. Thank you. Before going to the next question, I want to remind the honourable members and ministers, when you ask your question and after you answer your question, please mute your microphones. Uh, it's not unlike uh, us to actually start talking and forget that it's on. It'll just make it much easier for the person who's asking the question or answering the question. The honourable member for dufferin Caledon. Mr. Speaker, support for people with disabilities is inadequate. There's a problem when medically assisted death is easier to access than disability support. Krista Carr of Inclusion Canada, an organization that works with people with disabilities, called Bill C-7 our worst nightmare. Dr. Gallagher from U of T is concerned Bill C-7 will single out our elderly and it could lead to preventable deaths. Why won't the Minister of Justice listen to these concerns and accept our reasonable amendments to protect the most vulnerable in Canadian society? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, the bill that's being studied, uh, C7, in front of the community, heard very compelling testimony from a series of stakeholders, including persons with disability. All of those submissions are being carefully considered by the committee by the committee and were also carefully considered by the ministers of health, uh, persons with disabilities and the minister of justice during the consultations that took place in January. This bill is an important one. It balances the need to protect those who are vulnerable with ensuring the autonomy of Canadians who are making choices about their own bodies and their own capacities. We'll work in endeavor to listen to all stakeholders to craft a carefully balanced bill. Thank you. Honorable member for Surrey Newton. Mr. Speaker, the COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated how critical our digital communications capacity is. In a time where physical distance is the new norm, countries around the world are supporting people and businesses with digital governance. Can the minister tell this house what best practices Canada has learned from other nations and what kind of collaborations Canada is leveraging with our partners? Honourable Minister. Well, I thank the member from Surrey-Newton for his question and for his hard work for his constituents. Canada recently hosted the 7th Annual Digital Nations Summit, and that was a virtual gathering, and it was a gathering of international digital leaders. We discussed our responses to the pandemic and, in fact, our successes in using technology innovation to help serve people uh, in that urgent time, this urgent time, actually. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I am working to accelerate this uh, government transition to provide all Canadians with digital services that are secure and easy to use and reliable and which they can use from any device they choose. The Honourable Member for London, Fanshawe. Abacus Data published a report this morning. They found that young people in Canada are among the hardest hit by COVID-19, and they must make fundamental shifts in their education, employment, and finances. Today, the Prime Minister reiterated the importance of young people taking this virus seriously. I find this particularly condescending, considering his government has held nearly a billion dollars from students. It is stuck in the liberal scandal limbo, and now students are left to struggle on their own. Is it the government's position that if their liberal friends can't get their money, then no one will? Minister. Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to respond to the member's question, and I appreciate her advocacy on behalf of young Canadians from coast to coast to coast. Our government will continue representing and supporting young people because we know that the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted all Canadians, disproportionately certain segments, and young people, students are no exception. And that's exactly why we came out with a CAN emergency student benefit. That's why we put a moratorium on CAN student loans. For young entrepreneurs, we increased uh, funding to Futurepreneur, CAN a summer jobs are still open so young people can obtain that Canadian work experience. We will continue working on behalf of young people and I look forward to working with the Honourable Member so that we can deliver for all Canadians from coast to coast to coast. Honourable Member for Fredericton. Thank you Mr. Speaker. 
I've had the honor of meeting with the presidents of two Royal Canadian Legions in my riding, and I've had countless conversations with veterans and advocates who brought critical issues to my attention. Right before Remembrance Day, we heard our government thank veterans for their bravery and their sacrifices. We honor them with poppies once a year, and we fail them the rest of the time. A staggering number of backlog cases and thousands of homeless veterans are ample evidence. Mr. Speaker, there is a distinct moral, social, legal, and fiduciary covenant between Canada and the active and retired members of the Canadian Armed Forces. Can the Minister of Veterans Affairs say if these obligations are upheld by this government? And following the welcomed announcement to support veterans organizations, does he also plan to increase the direct support to veterans and their families? Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I, I thank my honourable colleague for the question. As she is well aware, we fully intend to address the homeless issue with veterans, and there's a number of groups who we did support uh, with C4 in order to make sure they had the appropriate funding. This is part of what helps to make sure we have organizations who have boots on the ground that find the people, the veterans who are who are homeless and work. Perhaps they need the emergency fund or whatever. There's a number of avenues for them to use, but of course the organizations themselves have to have appropriate funding and that's why we made sure they have the funding so we can deal with the veterans housing problem in this country. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.